be recording this one. Eek. Okay. Sorry, guys. I forgot to record from the beginning. You'll have to read your book. Um, so, from the perspective of, you know, from a clinical perspective, it's not certainly an insult to say that someone's drug has, suffers from mental retardation. It's a diagnosis. Um, disorders of development, uh, normally with cerebral palsy, you have, and a lot of times when children are born with birth defects or various and sensory mental retardations when they're born, they also suffer from secondary ailments. Like for example, it's quite common for someone with cerebral palsy to have scoliosis. Um, all right, so because developmental disabilities are generally present at birth, they are not considered to be mental illnesses, but this is something that would be considered in a DSM. This would be something that would be considered in a clinical evaluation. Mental retardation refers to significantly low general intellectual functioning. Okay, so you have here, the text uses mild mental retardation, moderate mental retardation, and profound mental retardation. You remember that I have that old book that was my father's from when he was in high school a long, long time ago, and the words were imbecile, moron, idiot, and I can't remember the rest of them. But the measurements are the same. They just use less offensive terms now. And those terms become offensive because people use them to demean people who don't suffer from the ailment, right? Like, so if you call, I'm sure back in the day, if you were referring to someone with this IQ level and you said you referred to him as an imbecile, you were saying something like he's a diabetic or he's a heart patient. You weren't saying, you weren't, you weren't insulting him, you were classifying him, but it became an insult. Down syndrome is the most, me most common form of mental retardation. Um, Down syndrome is a DNA um, mess up. On the 23rd chromosome, there's a twist. And children who suffer from Down syndrome have, um, and I say children because the abortion rate, if someone finds out they are carrying a child that they know has Down syndrome, the abortion rate is 98%, 98%. How you find out when you're pregnant if your baby is uh, Down syndrome is through an am uh, is through amnios uh, an amniocentesis, which is a test where they take a big long needle and they stick it into the stomach, into the womb, and they take out some amniotic fluid and they test that fluid, and that fluid has the DNA of the mother and the baby, and so you can tell if the chromosomes are off. So. 98% of the time worldwide, if the mother knows her child, if the mother finds out her child has Down syndrome, they abort. So you hard, you're going to grow up in a generation, you're hardly ever going to see anybody with Down syndrome. But when I was young, it was fairly common. And you don't see a lot that are very old because their life expectancy, I want to say, is around 40 because they have secondary issues. They have heart disease more commonly. They have visual issues. Um, are you all familiar with the, the standard facial features of somebody with Down syndrome? They're, they have kind of what they call a mongoloid look. They have a very low nose bridge. Um, they have one of the interesting features, and I don't understand why this would be, is they have this line. They have a line that goes straight across their hands, whereas ours usually don't touch. Theirs goes straight across. It's kind of interesting. Um, and there's also, and I think he... And who? Heath and Zach? Grace, was it Zach that they said at one, that one time your mom was told? So how that happens and about, this, about the Down syndrome thing. This is the scary oh. thing is that you often get a false read. So there's a test a woman takes when she's four months pregnant called an alpha feta protein test. And that test is to check for spina bifida. Spina bifida is a condition where the spinal column doesn't close and it makes it so the child is usually never able to walk. So they found that a positive, a strong negative for spina bifida sometimes correlated to a positive for Down syndrome. So they call me and they say, hey, we need to run this test on you. And they wanted to do an amniocentesis. And I said, I'm not doing it because even if I knew that, I wouldn't do anything about it. So they get a lot of false positives on that, that first test, not the second test. An amnio is 100% accurate, but the first test, they get a lot of false positives. Okay, learning disorders. The categories of learning disorders are reading disorders, math disorders, disorder of written expression. The most common learning disorder diagnosed is dyslexia. Does anybody have any familiarity with dyslexia? 
Phoenix and Bella, where did you go? Josiah, are you familiar with dyslexia? I can tell by your handwriting that it is not a problem for you. No, I mean, sometimes I can't read my own handwriting, but uh, isn't dyslexia when they, uh, they get letters mixed up, letters and numbers, symbols? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and not just when they write them, but when they read them. So does anybody read on a Kindle? Not, not the Kindle app, but actually on a Kindle. When you read on a Kindle, there is a font that was created. It's called Open Dyslexic. And it's a font that was created specifically for people with dyslexia. And the letters are weighted. In other words, so you have an O at the bottom of the O. Um, there might be, um, hang on, let me write it down and I'll send you a picture of it. There might be a, um, uh, the O at the bottom might be thicker than it is at the top. And supposedly the fact that they're weighted keeps the dyslexic from flipping them. I don't know. I have a friend, one of my closest friends, college graduate, works with letters and numbers all the time. And she's severely dyslexic. We read a lot together and it takes her about longer to read and we all read. Motor skills disorders are characterized by significant impairment in the normal. Okay, so this would be like, for example, um, somebody that had um, CP, they couldn't grasp things or pick things up. Um, pervasive developmental disorders like autism and Asperger's. Um, autism is an impairment in social interaction and communication. Difficulty understanding another person's emotions and restricted stereotype patterns of behavior, interest, and activities. It's diagnosed at this writing in boys four times more than it is in girls. Today, seven years, uh, eight years later, it's um, 10 times more in boys than it is in girls. Um, there are lots of people who believe that it's related to the mercury that is in our vaccines. Um, there's an anecdotal population of mothers called Believe Mothers that will tell you that vaccine, that before their child was vaccinated, they didn't exhibit these signs. Asperger's syndrome is somewhat similar, except Asperger's not characterized by delays in language, cognition, or self-care. So Asperger's, people with Asperger's might still have some of the social difficulties, but they can take care of themselves. Whereas severely autistic people if you've ever seen someone severely autistic, we're talking about like the people that hit themselves in the head, the people that freak out. If we watched a clip from Rain Man, that is what severe autism looks like. Self, uh, self affliction, they hurt themselves. Okay, ADHD and ADD. Single most common problem that brings children to the attention of psychologists and psychiatrists. Now, if you go to see a psychiatrist, you do not get therapy, you get medication. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor, an MD. Um, they don't do a psychological rotation. They go to medical school, they do their internship, and then they do their residency in a psych ward. So a psychiatrist doesn't deal with normal people that have problems. They deal with abnormalities. So it's very different. So if you go to a psychiatrist, you're going to get a drug. You're not gonna get therapy. Um, or if he doesn't want to give you a drug, he's going to send you to a therapist. He's not going to talk to you. It's not the way it works. It's not the same as a psychologist. Um, the, I'm sure you all know, I don't have to read it to you and you don't have, I mean, you can read it yourself. The effects of ADD and ADHD. Also very controversial. Um, in the corner on page 160, there's a little blurb about stigma. In addition to troubling thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, People with mental illness often experience stigma. Stigma refer refers to a stereotype that having a mental illness is a reflection of one's character. And you saw in that video, you know, how they're misrepresented. Um, we know a guy that was in a terrible motorcycle accident. No reason in the world he should have lived. Terrible head injury. He was in therapy for 18 months. And he was probably mm, late 20s, early 30s when it happened. So now he's, and he recovered, but he has brain damage and he functions, but he's lost all of his inhibitions. Like all of the things that made him socially acceptable are out. So you're standing next to him at church and he just farts like loud, you know, and people say, you know, John. And he's like, like, he's lost all of that because that part of his brain 
is broken, right? Um, so when you talk about the stigmas, like there's some stigmas surrounding John's condition. Fortunately for John, he couldn't care less, but I'm sure his wife cares, but he doesn't care. So ADHD and ADD, there's a lot of stigma with that. In fact, that's one of the reasons that I continue to homeschool because Hoyt's older brother was just one of those boys that he had to constantly be moving. And I do believe that if he had gone to public school, he would have been in trouble. Thank you, Bella, for sharing that. Um, so there's a stigma with that. There's a stigma with, I mean, obviously there's a stigma with schizophrenia. You have opinions about people that are schizophrenic. But ADHD and ADD are one of the hardest because boys get labeled when they're little and they struggle to ever, ever break that stigma. Um, oppositional defiant disorder, defiance disorder. Have I ever told any of you in this class that I think you have oppositional defiance disorder? Bella, have I ever told you that? Somebody, I know I told somebody. ODD describes children with patterns of negativity, hostility, defiant behavior who often lose their temper, blame others for their mistakes, irritable, um, mostly people who don't want to do what you tell them to do. Conduct disorder, repetitive and persistent patterns of behavior. But you see these behaviors in kids with trauma. Uh, I'm sure, Grace, you've heard some of these terms before when y'all have been talking about fostering and adopting. Um, beneath that, you have feeding and eating disorders. It's interesting, and I don't know, I haven't really looked too far ahead. They talk about, are y'all familiar with the concept with the term pika? It's when you eat, pregnant women sometimes develop this, you have a desire to eat something that's not edible. Sometimes um, patients with um, Alzheimer's will develop this. I had a friend whose mother had Alzheimer's and she lived, she had a house at the beach and her mother would always eat, like she had decorative shells around and her mother would eat the seashells. And she broke some of her teeth because she kept eating the seashells. Um, but they don't mention, uh, uh, bulimia or anorexia, maybe we're going to get to that, but that would also be, eat, those would also be eating disorders. And then tick disorders, are you familiar with Tourette syndrome? Uh, they, they do mention bulimia and anorexia in here. But not in this part, later. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, Josiah, can you explain Tourette syndrome to the class? Uh, Tourette syndrome is basically when people just blurt out random things uh, uncontrollably. A lot of the times it's uh, vulgar cuss words and whatnot. They can't control it. Yeah. And it's also it's a Some people have like a tick, like a physical tick. That's part of Tourette's. Um, separation anxiety disorder. This is a very tr common trauma disorder. Um, so it's normal, you know, you're leaving your three-year-old um, with the babysitter. It's normal for there to be a little bit of, you know, discomfort but for them to just freak out and lose it and like really, really have a, a, a panic attack, that's more of an anxiety disorder. And then reactive attachment disorder. We talked about RAD, I think when we talked about development, does that sound right, Grace? Do you remember that? Yes. Um, and this is very disturbing and inappropriate social behavior that usually appears before age five, um, generally associated with kids who have had very traumatic early childhoods. Often this happens to kids who are in orphanages that are overpopulated or have had adoption stories that were you know, traumatic or um, other types of abandonment type things. So those are all the, um, those are all the difference the different, or well, not all of them, but several that he goes through on the 17 diagnostic categories. So those are the ones of childhood and adolescence, okay? Then we're gonna talk about cognitive, and I think that's all we're gonna do for today. Cognitive disorders are a category of conditions that involve disturbances in thinking, memory, language, and awareness of surroundings. There are three types, delirium, dementia, and amnestic. Okay, delirium, is a temporary condition. Um, it's like how you are when you get hit in the head. Um, you're just delirious, you're out of it. Um, hallucinations, very short-lived, one week to one month. They're caused by, generally by injury. Um, professional athletes sometimes suffer from delirium. 
Did anybody see the movie um, with Will Smith about the professional Concussion. players? What's it called? Concussion. Concussion. That's a really, really interesting movie about this. Um, I put it in the text because it's super interesting about um, what can happen. Because um, I think when this is on video, they can see that too. Um, about what can happen to the brain when it gets hit repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. And Will Smith plays this physician that realized this, right? Um, I don't believe there's any reason that any of you couldn't watch it. Um, dementia, we talked about dementia and we talked about development. It's, you know, primarily something associated with age. It's characterized by aphasia. Aphasia is the loss of language, not the loss of the ability to speak. You don't lose your ability to speak. You lose your, you lose your language. You lose your alphabet. Um, stroke patients have aphasia, often have aphasia. Um, then you have um, apraxia, the loss of ability to perform simple motor tasks. You just can't tie your shoes, can't um, button your shirt. And then agnosia, the inability to identify and name objects. Um, Alzheimer's patients, Parkinson's patients, Huntington's, Korea, um, other diseases where you forget your family members, you forget what day it is, things like that. And then finally, there's amnestic disorders, also called amnesia, and they're characterized by an impaired ability to create new memories or retrieve past memories. And it kind of can go with Alzheimer's, but it's more associated with an actual brain injury. So like my friend John, this is what he suffers from. And then there are the substance-related disorders. Um, there are 120 disorders related to drugs, and that could have changed with the 2013 DSM. The side effects, medications, and exposure to toxins. And then you've got the class of drugs there. Most of them we've already talked about in our, in our chapter on consciousness. But you can have residual effects from the use of some drugs that cause mental impairment for your whole entire life. You can have one bad trip with LSD and for the rest of your life have hallucinations from one use. So um, they can be life changing. Um, and then on the next page, they talk about um, substance dependence, tolerance and withdrawal, which we talked about when we talked about consciousness. Okay, I'm gonna send you some things. Um, Phoenix sent something. Has anybody else sent any further study? Phoenix, would you like to share any more about what you learned? I think I pretty much put it all in the email. Um, just the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath is that they're, um, every psychopath is a sociopath, but not every sociopath is a psychopath because sociopaths have, um, four traits that I can't remember them all off the top of my head right now, but they have at least one pathological trait, which I tried to find a list of, but all that came up were just, um, just like research and studies and that kind of stuff. And I really did not feel like reading a 25 page report, <laughs> but, um, uh, aside from that, they will, they have like a distorted sense of self. So their self image is just not, um, not really founded in right. the right things or sometimes not even founded in anything. And uh, they're gonna have at least like one gaping hole in their identity that like normal people usually have. Um, and then there's something else, but the most important thing is that it's like normal for their age because technically speaking, all teenagers are sociopaths, which is why um, you can't diagnose anybody until they're 18 because every teenager is a sociopath, technically speaking. Um, yeah, but, because you have a grandiose sense of self, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then psychopaths have all those traits, but they were born instead of, they were born that way and because they were born that way and usually it goes hand in hand with some kind of um, bad environment as they grow up it um, fosters their sociopathy and um, 
they get really good at hiding it and just taking out their pathological traits in ways that like are, serial killing. sorry like serial killing like, like killing, serial animals, killing. Yeah. killing small animals stuff like that yeah, yeah. That's how Free Dahmer started that's how Bundy started yeah or or other things like there are a lot of psycho psychopaths that aren't serial killers um so they might like Psychopaths and sociopaths both have a need for power. So they could acquire like a very high job position and get pleasure from firing people. And, uh, and because they're so um, good at hiding it, like they preface it with, I'm so sorry, I hate to do this, but we have to fire you, but they're actually happy about it and just things like that. Not every psychopath is a serial killer. But every serial killer is a psychopath. Exactly. How about you, Josiah? What did you find interesting in what you've read of this chapter so far? I think I found it, uh, the one thing that I found interesting, so if I haven't read a ton, but I was kind of caught off guard by the, uh, by the, uh, the Drapetomania. Uh, mental illness of slaves wanting to run away from their masters. I just thought that was kind of interesting, and I didn't, I, I didn't know that was once considered a mental illness. Yeah, like so why that, would you run away from this? Yeah. Well, and I think I think the fact that something like that made the cut as a mental illness makes it so that you can start adding things like or taking things off like homosexuality and saying this is like running away from a slave. Like, this is just, of course, this is, this is how I am. And, you know, so anyway, I think it's interesting. I'm going to send you some links. Um, I want to go quickly to the quiz. I want to explain to you again, like how I did it, what happened. So I want you to take it as many times as you want to take it, because to me, however many times you take it, that's just the more information you get when the goal for me is actually that I want you to learn the material anyway. So, but I look at every answer, every fill in the blank answer on your first attempt, because that tells me, did you know when you didn't see it coming? And I look at the time to see how long it took you to take the quiz. So if it takes, if Bella takes it three times and on the first one she misses half of the fill in the blanks and it takes her 18 minutes, but on the second one she gets them all right, but it takes her 45 minutes, that tells me she might have had her book out, right? Because it took her a lot, why would it take her a lot longer to do the same exact test that she already took one time? So I'm checking to see how- I could have studied the flashcards under the quiz. You can, and I want you to, because the goal for me is not the grade. I mean, as you know, the goal for me is that you learn the material. So in some ways, even if your grade on this is lower, which nobody's asking, you're learning more in some ways because you're repeating it. Although I'm not, you know, some of the questions are, it's interesting to me to lose control over how they come. I don't know if I have a way to make them go in order, but it's interesting to me because I put them in the order that I would give them to you. And then they, you're upside down, Matthew. 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 You're yeah. upside down. I had a question. Yeah, my phone is dying. <laughs> Who had a question? I did. Okay, what, Phoenix? Um, do you consider homosexuality a mental illness? Do I consider it a mental illness? I don't consider it a mental illness, but I do believe that, okay, if I told you that someone grew up in a house with, um, let's say their, their parents were married, but their uh, mom had, their parents stayed married, but their mom had 25 affairs, okay? And then you knew that that girl grew up to be very promiscuous. Would you make that connection? Well, her example was someone who thought it was okay to have. Okay, so going back to Freud, um, I believe there's something to the idea that every single thing that happens to us in our life affects us at some level. And your family of origin is the strongest influence in your life. So if you grow up 
there's a pattern you can look, you can study the literature and you can see a pattern. For example, male homosexuals, something like 90% of the time, come from a family with a very dominating mother and a very absent father. There's a pattern. Lesbians, there's a pattern. Um, I don't think it's quite that high, but where you have often a very assertive, aggressive father that kind of has the effect of having an aversive effect on the women, on, on his daughter. And so you might have a very aggressive father. One girl becomes a lesbian, the other becomes a prostitute, right? But I think that your, your brain registers and processes and you go like, how does this life that I live fit into who I'm going to become? I don't believe, um, I don't believe the data supports. Now, I say that, but I think that the acceptance of homosexuality has probably really changed the prevalence of homosexuality. So like, for example, um, in colleges, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but there is a, um, uh, a group, there is a, there's a trend in some universities for girls to become uh, lugs. Do you know what a lug is? Lesbian until graduation. So all through college, they live and act like lesbians because if they're in a sorority or if they're hanging out with their friends, it's perfectly acceptable. They're all together all the time. They don't have to worry about the whole dating thing. Then they graduate from college and they look for a husband. It's a really common thing. Um, so that person, I think, has some different kinds of issues, but that's not a person for whom homosexuality is actually a lifestyle forever, right? I don't think it's a mental illness as much as a symptom of stuff, you know? I mean, everybody has stuff. So you grew up in an abusive childhood and for some people, they um, end up being abusive. And for some people, like when we were, you were there, Phoenix, when we were at the, when the counselor came, Grace, what's her name? What's the counselor's name that spoke to us at school? What does she look like? She wears cowboy boots. She's kind of rough looking. Y'all don't remember her name? What's her oh, name? Oh, Shauna, Ms. Shauna. What's her name? Shauna Ortiz. Right. So remember she was talking about how she had picked up this kid and he was like in his 20s and his excuse to her was, you know, well, you don't know what I've been through. When I was little, we were sexually abused and blah, 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 blah. And she's like, right. And you became a pedophile and your brother became a cop. So I think that it's hard to get away from not becoming somehow at some level for good or for bad, a product of your environment. So if we're gonna say, for example, of a promiscuous woman, that because her dad always sent the message that her sexuality was the only thing positive about her, she became promiscuous. How could we deny the possibility that how sexuality was viewed in a home would affect a homosexual male? I think it all goes together. Now, do I think of homosexuality the way I think of schizophrenia? Absolutely not. I believe we're all sinners in need of grace. And I know personally, um, the stories of about four different gay men that came out of that lifestyle, Christians that came out of that lifestyle that will 100% say, this was part of my journey to Jesus, you know? So, book about that. Yeah, there's a great, I have a book, it's called Out of the Far Country. Yes, um, that's the one. Yeah, it's a great book. I read that book. It's a great book. Well, that guy that wrote that book is a speaker at Summit Ministries um, that I keep oh, cool. that I keep telling y'all's parents to send you to. Yeah. I think my mom's gonna send me there. You should or at me. least do it online. Online, yeah, you should do it. It's so inexpensive to do it online. And he's one of the leaders. Um, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So I mean, that's my position, and I believe that I have biblical support for that position. I don't think being gay. Um, living a homosexual lifestyle is any more of a sin as living any kind of godless lifestyle. Um, so I don't think it's a mental illness. I don't think I would qualify it like that, but I do think that it's probably a symptom 
of some stuff that needs to be dealt with. You know, thoughts, opinions, comments, criticisms, Josiah. I have this feeling, Josiah, sitting in a corner. Are you in a corner, Josiah? Kind of. It's a square. It's a square. Okay. Anybody? Anything? Anywhere? No? Bella? Um, yes, Bella. I'm doing my further study on ADHD. Okay. Well, you've got lots of material, baby. I can tell you that. Um, one of the interesting side effects of ADHD is that um, these drugs, Ridley and Adderall, these drugs have been dispensed so fluidly that they're often now sold on the secondary market. You know, so like um, my girls actually had a friend that got busted and, you know, got probation for a while. And he was in like, how old was he when Sid got arrested for that? Was Sid selling Adderall? Yeah, he was selling his Adderall. So he, he was in like high school and he was selling it to, he was like a person and he was selling it to the seniors who were trying to study to get the grades at. So yeah, it's a pretty common thing. There's a whole secondary market because of it. And I think- take it during the finals week. That's the, like the biggest age group. Yeah. The danger with it is that we don't have any long-term studies on what the medications actually do. So, anybody else? This is a huge uh, chapter. Yeah. Huge. Yes, Matthew. Well, I got uh, I got to ask you a question. Uh, so I I'll, I'll do my further study on hallucinations. Okay. Would that be acceptable? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I also got one question. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, basically, about the end of time. My, if there was a person, one one human being, that would be the downright spiteful, corrupted, like one hundred percent. But how do you feel to your people? And to and to the day they die. And and like. If they, how to work this? If they were to possibly give their life to God and actually mean it before they actually, um, before they actually die, would it be saved in salvation? I believe, or it, or like a long time? I believe that up until the last moment of your life, if you cry out to Jesus like a thief, you get to go with him to paradise that day. That's what the Bible says. The thief next to Jesus said, hey, take me with you. And Jesus said, surely I tell you today, you will be in paradise. I believe in Jesus in the last breath. The sad thing, the beauty of that is you still get to go. The sad thing is that you wasted your whole life. You know? Because it's not about the number of days we have on this planet. We're not really going to days we have. So, but yes, absolutely nothing. Up to the very last breath, I think you have a chance. Thank you for asking the question. Anybody else? Anything else? Grace is filling her country woman for the afternoon. What were you sewing? What? what were you sewing? What? What were you sewing? Oh, I was having to fix my. Um, I don't want to get rid of my old Converse because they had a rip in them like this big. I, I was trying yeah. trying to save them, but I don't think it's gonna work. It's a lot different than fixing a pair of pants. <laughs> Okay, guys, anything else? Oh, uh, yeah, one more thing. Yes. So, what sandwich did you get on the personality quiz? Oh, yeah, what sandwiches did y'all get? I don't think I took it. Okay, we'll take it and we'll email it to you, Matthew. Okay, uh, I, so I got two minutes left, guys. Talk to you later. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Bye, everybody. Stay safe. Bye, Joseph. Bye.